author Robert Byron wisely said, the purpose of life is to have a life of purpose. All of us, whether you realize or not, are looking for a life of purpose. I was too. I discovered mine by adopting one simple daily habit. That daily habit was live to give. Yes, live to give. Living to give philosophy means that you make giving the core purpose of your daily living. You make it a way of life. Everything you do, you permeate with giving. The way you interact with your family, you deal with your customer, even with a distant, unknown stranger. You use compassion, empathy, non-judgment. You might say, Azim, in my to-do list, a never-ending to-do list, I don't have time for one more thing. My goal today is to make you realize the beauty and the bounty and the joy of giving. Many of us spend our lives in the pursuit of getting, getting, getting. We sacrifice our family, we sacrifice our relationship, we sacrifice our health, and despite all the possessions and achievements, we still feel empty. We still don't feel deeply fulfilled. On the other hand, when you live to give, you are helped to find your purpose. When you help to find your purpose, you tap into your potential. When you tap into your potential, you make impact. And when you make impact, you find deep fulfillment. Dr. Stephen Post, a researcher, best-selling author, has funded over 50 scientific studies in top universities in the US. And he has concluded that a simple act of purposeful giving enhances the giver's happiness, health, resilience, creativity, and longevity. Incredible. Just a simple, purposeful act of giving. And guess what? Science also says human beings are hardwired to give. We are born to give. We have an innate need to give. In 1997, I got a call from a chairman of a nonprofit organization asking me to go to Pakistan to work out the financial needs of the Afghan refugees. I volunteered to go. I spent six weeks there. Many things happened there that shook me, but one incident changed my life forever. I was asked to go to a refugee camp where I went there and I was escorted to a small tent which housed 11 refugees. As I went inside the tent, I could see the kitchen, I could see the mattresses, and I could see clouds of mosquitoes. There was no furniture. We sat on the ground. As we sat on the floor, I was given a cup of tea, a hot cup of tea, and some dry fruits. So be before we began to speak, I took a sip. And as I took a sip, I looked around, there was a glow in everybody's face. What happened? I just took a sip. It made me realize that they felt rich giving me a cup of tea. It made me realize you don't have to be rich to give. Rather, you become richer when you give. So, before me asking them about financial needs, I said, let me build some rapport. So I said to them, share your story. How did you come from where you were to where you are? So Bahar, the 16-year-old girl, shares with me, Azim, we left Afghanistan with just our clothes in our back. Walked for days in the mountain. My cousin went to labor, gave birth to a baby in the mountain. My mother got so very ill, but we had to keep walking to survive. Imagine you are thrown out of your house with nothing but your clothes that you're wearing. 
and you had to walk for days in the mountain, and you have your cousin giving birth and your mother getting sick, and you had to keep walking not knowing where you're going and what to expect. I heard several other stories, including kids losing their father in murder, a young baby of one month old losing his dad. His dad. I was shattered. I was heartbroken. It was painful. Eventually, when we came to financial needs, Jawed, the 18-year-old boy, shares with me that they were working for 14 hours a day in the hot, blazing sun, selling corn in the trolley in the market, making $1 a day. It seemed like they had nothing in life to hold on to but each other. And that was their way of live to give. After about 40 minutes, I had, I had been exhausted and shattered and broken. So I left the tent and was going to my taxi to go back to my hotel. I see young kids staring at me with hope in their eyes. And I'm walking away to my taxi, I'm looking at them. And there's a connection. There's a connection. I go in my taxi to my hotel. In the taxi, I'm sitting at the back. I'm shivering and I'm sweating. Have you ever experienced shivering and sweating together? And I sobbed like a baby, looking out of the window for the whole trip to the hotel. And my soul was shaken. I come to the hotel, nice lobby, waiters, hotel, there's everything. They had nothing. What a contrast. I go inside my room, I go in my bed and curl up into a bowl and cry for what seemed like hours, seeing the rosy chicks and the smile of the kids outside the tent, despite their plight, and replaying what I was shared in the tent again and again with emotions of hopelessness and yet determination to do something bigger, not just as an interviewing volunteer, but espousing something greater and I fell asleep. When I woke up in the morning, in my mind's eye, I could see a fork on the road. If I go left, I continue my comfortable lifestyle and forget the powerful experience I had. If I go on the right, my life is going to be filled with obstacles, but an opportunity to make positive impact. I was in a dilemma. What do I do? But deep down, I knew there was no turning back. What would you do if you were in my shoes? I'm sure you would want your life to matter. It took me only a few seconds to decide that right is right. And when I made that decision, something magical happened. I almost felt like I found a cause that I would die for. I was 43 years old. I had never found any cause that I would die for. And the irony was, when I found a cause that I would die for, my new life began. It was a pivotal moment in my life. It reminded me of the philosopher Mark Twain, who said, there are two most important days in your life. The day you're born, and the day you find out why. So, what do I do with this new energy? I had two choices. I was an accountant. I had a business. I could work there, make some more money, give them. But somehow it seemed like a drop in the ocean. There are millions of people. Today, UN says there are 700 million people across the world who are in abject poverty. I felt that wouldn't do much. It would do something, but not much. And I was so excited that I wanted to do much. The second thing I could do was I used to inspire in my community before going to Pakistan. I used to talk about giving, but it was a hobby. I would talk two hours here, maybe a month later I might talk three hours there, but I was effective. I said, if I do that full time, speak about giving, write about giving, I can impact millions of people. That seemed very exciting. I was willing to jump off the cliff backwards, give up my business and my accounting degree and do this. I found my purpose to change from accounting for business which is accounting for profit, to accounting for life, which is accounting for impact. People spend their whole life looking for their purpose. 
Some die never finding it. I found my purpose in a tiny refugee tent. A priceless gift. Now I come home to Vancouver, Canada, back home from Pakistan. I have one more accounting to do. It's called accounting for wife. <laughs> so I'm saying to my wife, Frizana, my wife, Frizana is a street smart, financially astute and practical person. It wasn't going to be easy. I'm saying to her, honey, I'm excited. I want to do accounting for life and give up the accounting degree and the business because I can really help them. She's saying, Azim, I sent you to Pakistan to use your degrees, not to lose them. <laughs> then she's saying to me, Azim, can you explain to me how this accounting for life will do the accounting for the kids' university fees? Our daughter Sahar is eight and our son Tofik is three. I bet you do the same thing if you're in her shoes. And my energy and enthusiasm zapped. I was brought back down to reality. So I had to take a pause. But I knew that my wife sent me there, so she cared about the, the, the people. So I persevered, and she came around, but with one strong condition. And the condition was that we don't sell our accounting businesses. And luckily, I listened to her, because I struggled for a few years, you know, going nowhere. I'm an accountant, not a writer. I don't know how to write, and I'm writing books. So my wife, Rizana, and my business partner, Ken, managed the accounting business and supported me while I struggled. Now, I want to make an important point here. We all stand on other people's shoulders. Other people help us. So it's only fair we pay it forward. I got help by both my partner and my wife, and it's my job to pay it forward. Fast forward 20 years. I want to share two things with you. What has happened, and what did I learn in the journey? And why I'm so upbeat about Live to Give. What I did was, for the last 20 years, I spent about 25 hours a week on average helping people like Bahar, Rahila, and Javed around the world to give them hope and independence by giving them a hand up, not a hand out. I wrote nine books on Live to Give. The most popular book was The Power of Giving, which won a Nautilus Gold Award for books that create social change. It was translated in 10 languages. And I spoke every opportunity for Live to Give around the world for the last 20 years. What did I learn in the process? I learned, as you aspire to live to give, the universe conspires to help you. Every time there's a roadblock, a new road appears. And what happens is, you become fearless. You become so excited, because it's no longer about you anymore. It, I found that happened to me. I had a road appear every time I got stuck, and my goals multiplied. In accounting, I would probably reach a maximum of 1,000 people, maximum. But in this career, I reached millions of people because it was something I became fearless about. Secondly, as you try to help others, you get helped. In my case, I went to transform the lives of the refugees. In the process, my life got transformed. And thirdly, your, your work becomes meaningful. You get passion, you get purpose. You get excited. In my case, my vocation became my vacation. I love my work. I wake up in the morning excited, pumped up. I'm 67, but I feel more energetic and younger than I was 43. Some people think I go to the gym, but they don't realize I listened to John Holmes, the author of The Longest War, where he said, there is no better exercise for the heart than lifting people up and getting them off. <laughs> so that's a great exercise, helping people. And on top of all this, my daughter Sahar, in her late 20s, gave up a high-paying job and began a maternal and child health social enterprise in Kenya. So for me, the visit to Pakistan, the return on investment, I'm using the accounting term now, the return on investment of going to Pakistan was staggeringly high. Tangible and intangible. What I learned from the Pakistan visit, the joy and the beauty and the bounty and the power of giving. So how about you? Will you partner with me to make a world a better place? 
you might feel going to Pakistan, Afghanistan is not for me. No problem. You can pick a cause you care about. You can go to your neighborhood, local community. You can pick climate change. You can pick, uh, pick uh, poverty. You can start somewhere, small or different, until you find what sparks you. You might say, I don't have extra money. No problem. Give your time, give your knowledge, give your skills, give your experience. Give a listening ear, a compassion to somebody in mental health challenge or somebody who's isolated and lonely. You might say, I don't have time, I'm up to here. No problem. Permeate your giving in everything you do. It's not just what you do, but how you do it. You see, if there's one message I want you to take away, one message to the whole thing, it is that you can give every day. Not by what you do, but how you do it. You know, with your family, if you become a little bit more empathetic, if you become more responsive versus reactive, you become non-judgmental, you give people the benefit of doubt, or you give people the best possible interpretation, all these things make you go from ordinary to extraordinary. With your business customers, give them a little extra. Why would they make you feel, why would you, they feel you are special? It's by doing a little extra, not more effort, but do it with love and with care. And that gets your work from ordinary to extraordinary. Today, you're going to meet people. Instead of trying to get something from them, give something to them. And you will find that they will find you more valuable because they see you as a resource who can help them versus the other way around. If a refugee in abject poverty can live to give, so can you and me. Just close your fist. Close your fist. If I give you something, can you receive? Now open your fist and give. Now, if I give you something, can you receive? So the more in the flow of giving you are, the more giving flows through you. The more in the flow of abundance you are, abundance flows through you. The more you keep on giving, the more you keep on creating, innovating, and receiving. When you suppress giving, you suppress your gift. When you suppress giving, you suppress your calling. When you suppress giving, you suppress your passion. My friends, when you suppress giving, you suppress your fulfillment. You suppress your happiness. You suppress your deep, deep purpose. The purpose of life is a life of purpose. Begin a daily simple habit of live to give. Yes, live to give.